All right, let's dive into this book that's been rattling around in my head. It's called, Is the Universe an App? Exploring the Physics of Awareness. And it really digs into some fascinating questions about consciousness. Like, what is it really? And can we explain it purely through science? Yeah, the book takes a pretty bold approach. It suggests we treat consciousness as a scientific mystery, like we have with other phenomena. Kind of like thunder, right. <laughs> we used to think it was Thor banging his hammer, but now we understand it as electromagnetic currents. Exactly. The book argues that if consciousness goes beyond physics, well, our attempts to explain it physically will hit a wall eventually. Makes sense, I guess. <laughs> so how does the book go about tackling this? Well, it doesn't shy away from challenging some pretty fundamental ideas, like the idea of a unified self, you know, that feeling of I that we all have. The book suggests it might be an illusion. Whoa, hold on. How can our sense of self be an illusion? I mean, it feels so real. Think of it like this. Imagine a symphony orchestra tuning up, each instrument playing its own note. As they come together, a unified melody emerges, and then the conductor appears, seemingly orchestrating the whole performance. But the conductor only shows up after the music is unified. I'm starting to see where you're going with this. Right. It challenges the idea that there's a central self controlling everything. Maybe our sense of self is more like the conductor. It emerges from the coordinated activity of different parts of our brain. So it's not a singular entity, but an emergent property. Precisely. And the book explores this from different philosophical angles. You have materialists like Patricia Churchland who believe consciousness is purely brain activity. And then you have figures like Ramana Maharshi, who argue that consciousness is the fundamental reality and everything else is a manifestation of it. It's fascinating how the book presents these contrasting views, right? It lets the reader wrestle with the complexity of the issue. It makes you think there's no easy answer. It's not just black and white. Another point the book makes is how easily we misjudge consciousness in others. Like people getting fooled by animatronic figures at Disneyland thinking they're real. I get that. I've totally felt that twinge of is that thing actually alive yeah. when seeing a realistic robot? It shows how easily we project awareness onto things that mimic human behavior. It makes you wonder about the true markers of consciousness and how to tell the difference between sentience and just really good simulation. It's more than just outward behavior, right? There's the internal experience, too. The book talks about Ron Hubin, who was in a car crash and misdiagnosed as being in a coma for 23 years. Can you imagine? Being fully conscious, trapped inside your own body, unable to communicate, it shows how hard it is to determine consciousness just from the outside. It really makes you rethink how we measure and understand consciousness. And speaking of internal worlds, the book also looks at people with multiple personalities, where each personality seems to have its own distinct consciousness. I had a student once, Becky, who had multiple personalities due to childhood trauma. Each one was so different. Different ways of talking, dressing, interacting with the world. It really made me question the idea of a singular self. Cases like Becky's raise profound questions about identity. What's the real self when multiple consciousnesses exist within one person? Challenges that fixed notion of self, doesn't it? Absolutely. It suggests our identities might be more fluid and complex than we think. The book then brings up this thing called the Chandian effect named after Fakir Chand, an Indian mystic who had incredibly vivid religious visions. Oh, I remember reading about him. He was certain they were real. He even ate cow dung because he thought it was a divine command. It was, right. Well, the remarkable thing is he later started to doubt his own visions. He realized they were coming from his own mind, shaped by his beliefs and expectations. So even our strongest convictions, the things that feel undeniably real, can be mental constructs. That's the point of the Chandian effect. It blurs the line between what's internal and what's external. It's like our perceptions aren't always accurate reflections of reality. The book then delves into integrated information theory, which basically proposes that consciousness. Hold on, before we jump into that, can you give us a quick rundown of what integrated information theory actually is? I think some listeners might not be familiar with it. Sure, no problem. It suggests that consciousness is a product of how complex information processing is in a system, whether it's organic like a brain or inorganic like a computer. So the more interconnected and complex the flow of information, the higher the potential for consciousness. Exactly. Think of a simple calculator versus a massive neural network. The neural network, with its huge interconnectedness and complexity, would have a higher level of consciousness. Okay, that makes sense. So, the book uses this theory to explore the possibility of consciousness in non-organic systems. 
like the internet. Precisely. It explores the mind-blowing idea that systems like the internet could become conscious as they become more complex and interconnected. Whoa, are we saying the internet could wake up one day and become <laughs> self-aware? That's one of the intriguing and maybe unsettling implications of this theory. It challenges our assumptions about where consciousness can exist. This is getting pretty wild. I'm curious, how does the book connect this to something called zombie consciousness? Zombie consciousness really gets at the core of what it means to be conscious. Imagine something that looks and acts human, but there's no inner experience, no awareness, no feelings, just going through the motions. That's kind of freaky, like a walking, talking shell. Mm -hmm. But how could we even tell if something was a zombie, especially if it was really good at pretending? Right. It's a tough one. It, it forces us to think about the subjective side of consciousness, the what it's like to experience something, which we can't really know in others. It's like those optical illusions. You see one thing or the other, depending on how you look. Maybe consciousness is like that. We only see the outside behavior, not the inside experience. Great analogy. The book uses a powerful example to illustrate this. It talks about a person with severe OCD whose life is dominated by intrusive thoughts. I can imagine how debilitating that would be. It shows that consciousness isn't always a good thing. It could be a source of real suffering. Exactly. And it ties back to zombie consciousness. Even if someone with OCD is acting normally on the outside, their internal experience is totally different. So we can't judge consciousness solely on external behavior. Absolutely. There's more to it than meets the eye. Yeah. It's not just information processing. It's the subjective experience, the feeling of what it's like to be. And that feeling, that qualia, is something we haven't figured out yet. It's the heart of the mystery. It's like that saying, you can't understand someone until you've walked a mile in their shoes. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll never truly grasp what it's like to be another conscious being. It's a humbling thought. It underscores the need for empathy, for recognizing that we can't truly know what's going on inside someone else. Now, the book also mentions this idea that our ability to understand others, to try to figure out what they're thinking and feeling, mm. that might have evolved before our own sense of self. Wow, that's fascinating. So zombie consciousness, acting without a fully developed self, that could have been a step towards self-awareness. Yeah, maybe we first learned to understand others, mm. to read their intentions, predict their behavior, and then turn that ability inwards, creating our own inner world. Makes you wonder if self-awareness is tied to our social nature, our need to connect with others. Right, like our social interactions created a mirror reflecting our own inner states back at us. Now, switching gears a bit, the book also touches on some pretty mind-blowing ideas, like the possibility of uploading our consciousness into digital realms, achieving a kind of digital immortality. Okay, now we're talking science fiction. Is that even remotely possible? How can you transfer something as intangible as consciousness into a computer? It sounds crazy, I know, but the book argues that if consciousness is fundamentally information, like integrated information theory suggests, then it's theoretically possible to transfer that information. So like copying a file from one hard drive to another. But consciousness is so much more complex than a file. It's our thoughts, feelings, memories, our whole experience. How could you possibly capture all of that? You're right, it's an incredibly complex challenge. But think about the progress we've made in genomics. We can map entire genomes, the software of life, and even create synthetic life forms. It's amazing what science can do. But even if we could map a whole brain, would that really capture consciousness? That's the big question. It brings us back to the hard problem of consciousness. How do physical processes in the brain create the feeling of subjective experience? So even a perfect replica of a brain might not actually be conscious. It might just be a really sophisticated simulation. It's a debate that's likely to go on for a long time. The book also tackles those big philosophical questions like free will. If consciousness is physical, just neurons firing, does that mean we're just biological robots following a program? Ah, yes. One of the biggest dilemmas of all time. If our actions are predetermined by our brains, where's the room for free will? It's a bit unsettling, isn't it? The thought that our choices, desires, our sense of agency might be illusions created by our brains. The book doesn't necessarily take a hard deterministic stance, though. It explores other perspectives, like the idea that free will exists on a spectrum. So it's not just free will or no free will. There's more nuance. Exactly. It's like a river flowing downstream. Okay. It's constrained by the riverbed, but within those constraints, it can flow in different ways. I like that. So maybe our genes and environment set the boundaries, but we still have some freedom to make choices within those boundaries. Precisely. It's a complex issue, no easy answers. So we're not puppets, 
but we're not completely free agents either. It's about recognizing the interplay of forces, some we control and some we don't. And how does the book tie all this back to, is the universe an app? Well, it doesn't give a definitive answer, but it makes us think about consciousness as more than a side effect of physics. It could be a fundamental force shaping reality itself. That's a powerful thought. Even if we're in a simulation, we're not just passive players, we're co-creating, shaping how things unfold. Like we're playing a cosmic video game and our choices influence the gameplay. Love that analogy. It turns the idea of simulation on its head. It's not a prison, it's a playground. Exactly. And that leads to another fascinating part of the book. It explores the possibility of consciousness in non-organic systems like AI. Wait, are we talking about conscious robots, self-aware computers? Oh. Is that even possible? The book argues that if consciousness comes from integrated information, mm. then it's not limited to biological systems. It could emerge in any sufficiently complex system that processes information. So our phones could become self-aware. Our cars could have existential crises. The internet could wake up and realize it exists. Those are some pretty wild possibilities. But seriously, is that even remotely plausible? It's definitely pushing the boundaries of what we currently understand, but the book encourages us to keep an open mind, to consider that our current understanding of consciousness might be limited. It's like we're still using a flip phone in a world of smartphones when it comes to understanding consciousness. That's a great analogy. And who knows, maybe those smart devices around us will become truly smart one day in ways we can't even imagine yet. Okay, let's say, for argument's sake, that AI does become conscious. What then? What kind of ethical dilemmas do we face? Well, the book delves into some of those thorny questions. For instance, if a machine becomes conscious, does it deserve rights? Do we treat it like a person or a piece of property? Those are some heavy questions. Yeah. And there's no easy answer, right? Not at all. It'll require a whole new way of thinking about ethics and morality. We might need to reevaluate our entire legal system. I mean, we've struggled with those kinds of questions throughout history. Think about slavery. We denied basic rights to entire groups of people because we didn't see them as fully human. Exactly. We can't afford to make those same mistakes with artificial consciousness. So how do we prepare for this potential future? The book stresses the importance of proactive dialogue. We need philosophers, ethicists, scientists, policymakers, and the public to start discussing these issues now before it's too late. It's like we need to lay the groundwork for a whole new society, one where humans and conscious machines coexist. Precisely. And that brings us back to the central question of the book. Is the universe an app? Yeah, I've been thinking about that a lot throughout our conversation. It's a question that's been pondered by philosophers and scientists for centuries. Are we living in a simulation? Is there a programmer behind it all? I mean, it's a pretty mind-bending thought. It is. But whether or not the universe is literally an app, the book's premise has deeper implications. What do you mean? Well, it challenges us to see the universe and ourselves in a new light. It suggests that consciousness might be more fundamental than we realize. So it's not just a byproduct of physical processes. Maybe it's woven into the very fabric of reality. Maybe it's a driving force behind the evolution of the universe. Whoa, so we're not just passengers on this cosmic ride. Maybe we're more like co-pilots actively shaping the course of the journey. That's pretty empowering. Even if we're in a simulation, we're not just puppets. We have agency. Our choices matter. Exactly. And that brings a sense of responsibility. If we are, in a sense, co-creating reality, then our actions have a profound impact, not just on ourselves, but on the universe as a whole. Okay, my head is spinning a bit, but I'm loving this conversation. What stands out to you the most from all of this? For me, it's the reminder that we still know so little about consciousness. It's this vast, mysterious frontier, and we're just beginning to explore it. And it's not just about studying it out there in the world. It's about exploring our own inner worlds. Absolutely. The book encourages us to cultivate our own consciousness through practices like meditation, mindfulness, even exploring altered states of awareness. It's like we're all on a quest to unlock the full potential of our minds. And in doing so, we might just discover that the boundaries between our internal and external worlds are more fluid than we thought, that we're more interconnected with everything than we realize. This has been an incredible deep dive. We've gone from the illusion of self to conscious coffee makers, from digital immortality to the meaning of it all. I'm left with more questions than answers, 
but in a good way. That's the beauty of these big questions. They ignite our curiosity and inspire us to keep exploring. So to our listeners out there, I encourage you to keep questioning, keep exploring, and keep pushing the boundaries of your own understanding. The universe is a vast and mysterious place, and there's always more to discover. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive.